Welcome to Speaking Our Peace. I'm Andy Luck, one of the producers for this podcast. In today's episode, Priya Joshi talks to four educators about their teaching practice and also their work to move our world closer to peace and nonviolence. These remarkable educators share their stories from around the world. Anindo Marshall is a dance educator based in Los Angeles, California. She's also working on getting a school set up in Kenya. Priya spoke to Anindo in early 2021 during the pandemic. Back in 2019, Priya talked to both Shiva and Christy during her trip to India. These conversations were the seeds for this podcast. Shiva is a man of many talents. He counts visual art, poetry, and music among his many different aspects of his teaching practice. He's also a teacher for more than 20 years in Madurai, a city in Tamil Nadu in the southern part of India. Christy Mahood is an elementary school teacher in Edmonton, Alberta, who's been incorporating different Gandhian ideas in her classroom. Finally, in late March this year, 2021, Priya had a brief conversation with Reva Joshi, reflecting on educators' work towards peace and nonviolence. Reva is one of the producers of this podcast and also a professor in education at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Ontario. Um, I was wondering if you wouldn't mind by starting just by telling me about yourself and the work that you're doing uh, in Kenya. Okay, I'll make it quick, short, you know, because uh, if I, I can get carried away, because it's such a long history. But anyway, my name is, uh, my full name is Sarah Anindo Marshall, but I go by Anindo Marshall. Uh, and I have been, well, I'm a performing artist, started off my career uh, as a performing artist in Europe with EMI Records. I lived in Germany and then I moved to the U.S., but I was always a dancing singer because I started taking dance classes and music classes when I was in Kenya. And that's what that's how I ended up getting a record deal. And when I was in Europe, I continued to study dance. You know, whenever I had a tour, whatever city we went to, I'd, I'd look for a studio and take whatever classes were available, or ballet, Afro, um, tap, uh, whatever I could just to keep studying, but I really was looking for Dunham technique. That's the technique that I was introduced to by a young lady called um, Sandra Barnes when I was in Kenya. And that was a technique that I loved to, I mean, it has, it, it has everything in it. It has, it has ballet, modern jazz, cultural context in the technique. And that's why I was drawn to it. And so when I came to the US, I uh, was had the pleasure to work with Catherine Dunham, who is the, she, she's, it's, it's, her, it's her technique. The Dunham technique is Catherine Dunham's technique. And I met her when I first got here and I studied with her and all those great, great choreographers. Uh, they're all passed on, but I had the pleasure to work with all of them. And um, at the same time, I was pursuing my music. So I worked with a great artist, Babatunde Olatunji. We opened for the Grateful Dead. I, worked, I did a, an album with Carlos Santana. Uh, with Olatunji and Ayerto and Mickey Hart of the Grateful Dead and open for James Brown. I have a band here in Los Angeles. I live in the Los Angeles area. It's an all-female band. And we've opened for um, James Brown and uh, worked with Harry Belafonte and uh, also, you know, played at Stevie Wonder's wedding about a few years ago. And so I've, I've done a lot of work and I continue to work with the band and also pursue the, the I'm now a dance teacher. Now I teach dance. Um, I pass, I'm passing on my knowledge to young, the younger generations. So I teach dance at USC as a professor in the dance, Gloria Kaufman School of Dance. And I also teach at Debbie Allen Dance Academy here in Los Angeles. And I teach at a high school called LAXA, which is the Los Angeles County High School of the Arts. It's the number one art school in the country right now we just got a rating the, the we got a number one status just a few months ago so that was wonderful good celebration congratulations and then I also, yeah and i also work i i work with a prison system where i go into prisons uh, initially i was working with the youth you know uh juvenile um camps and uh the state of california is going to discontinue those and i think it's a really good idea and put those troubled boys into programs instead of locking them up. Uh, so now I moved to a female, all female um, 
prison, which is in Chino. And I you know, teach percussion and, and writing, creative writing uh, there. Um, but with COVID, of course, none of that is happening. Everything is happening on Zoom. Um, as far as the prison go, we just send out packets because you know they don't have Zoom. But we send, I send out packets every week, uh, work packets for them. So that's what I do. And all this time with everything that I've learned in the US for years, I've been thinking, how can I give back? And uh, my father passed in 95 and he was, a re he was an educator. He worked at the University of Nairobi, he went to school in, in London and, and also in uh, Belfast in, in um, Ireland. So he was an educator and he, was, he, worked, he was a librarian, the chief librarian at the uh, University of Nairobi for many, many years until he retired. And after his passing, I, I said, you know, how can I honor him? And I decided back in 95, I think I'm gonna think about building a school and that way I can honor him and also give back and teach what I know to, to children in, in, back in Kenya. And that's where the idea was born back in 95. And it, it, it's taken all these years because I've continued to grow in what I do. Uh, and I had to come to a place where it was time for me to do that. So that's where I am now, you know, trying to build the Abukutsa Arts Academy uh, in Western Kenya. Um, in Kenya, where there was a lockdown, being a third world country, like all third world countries, it was it, the kids really suffered a lot because they don't have the resources. For instance, in Los Angeles, every child, at least my grandson goes to LAUSD, Los Angeles Unified School District, and he's six. Every kid got a device, an iPad, um, and they were able to continue online learning. I'm not sure that happened in Kenya. I'm not sure if Kenya has the resources to be able to, to uh, uh, my, the way I'm going to build the school is in a village called Luanda. It's a small village, not too far from Kisumu and it's in uh, Vihiga County. So it's a, it's a, it's a much economically, it's a, the poverty rate is pretty high in that particular village. So there was no learning going on, you know, um, with this disease and, um, I found that the arts, whether it's dancing or music or painting or theater, whatever it is, is medicine. So um, putting it part of the curriculum is we part of the academic, you're gonna have, we're gonna have an academic curriculum and an arts curriculum so that the children, it becomes part of life. And, and I find with indigenous cultures, um, African, even Native American, whatever, indigenous cultures, art is part of living. It's always been culturally. Uh, people always sang, you know, they sang whenever, you know, somebody passed away, there was a, there was a celebration, there was something celebrating their life, there was a song, there was a dance, there was something uh, that would honor the, the soul that is leaving. When a child is born, there's a song and there's a dance. So culturally, the arts has always been a part of an indigenous, an indigenous culture. So um, I think we're just gonna, it's, it's natural. It would be a natural thing to do is to infuse the arts with the academics to get the whole perfect student because it's the best way to learn. I wish I had more of that when I was younger. I, I, I met the arts a little late in life, but I was happy it was better late than never. And I, I looked at the way I was educated and I, I say, if, if I could have been educated the way that we're educating our students at LAXA, I would have been a better student. So I truly believe in that. And I truly believe in working with, with um, planet Earth, hands-on learning. You know, so we're gonna have a farm where kids will be hands-on learning about, instead of sitting in the classroom and looking at a board and learning it in the classroom, we're gonna be out there um, learning it in, in real time, you know, uh, working with plants on, and seeing how they grow on and their own land, them, right? On their own land. Yeah. And also, you know, having a farm, they'll be able to see how animals grow. So it's going to be a hands-on mm -hmm. part of it. It's, it's going to be a, a green school because I truly believe in, uh, working with the earth, you know, uh, having solar panels and, wind energy, solar energy, wind energy, biofuels, all those things are so important uh, to save this planet. So that school's gonna be built on that as well.
That's beautiful. I haven't built it yet. You know, I'm still, you know, in the process of buying the land and, and uh, the curriculum is, we're, we're going to start off with the younger uh, class, class uh, grades. It's, we're going to start off with preschool or, or what we call transitional kindergarten, which is four mm. and five will be kindergarten and first grade will be six uh, years old. So we're going to start with three classes and then let those classes be the graduating classes as we move up every year. Excellent. Oh, that's really cool. So they'll start from the beginning and then as they age, that will be, they will be like the older kids and then you have the younger kids that will then come in. Coming in. Yes. That's really yes. Cool. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, we're going to have like photography for them. Um, I'm hoping a company here, I'm, we're talking to companies here that will give us cameras, you know, like um, throwaway cameras or, you know, that we can use digital cameras. Mm -hmm. So these children can actually take pictures. So if we have a class of uh, flowers, they're going to go out and take pictures. See the, see the world in these children's eyes. It's just it's so intriguing. And I want to be able to give everything that I can to start performing arts schools in Kenya that very, very low income families don't come, can come in for free. If families do have a little bit of money, they can help the school by paying a little bit of school fees. But... Other than that, it's going to be for kids in the village and they don't have to pay. And that's why I fund, I'm fundraising here in the U.S., trying to get funds, you know, through my nonprofit organization called Marshall Dance Company, um, which I, crea I created in 2006. And uh, MDC, Marshall Dance Company, is, is going to be the nonprofit company that will be raising funds to build Abakutsa Arts Academy. So I just want to give everything that I know uh, to these kids and know that they'll be better than me. You know, that's what we want. We want our kids to be better and better than you were and take it to the next level. Uh, what, in whatever they do, what, whatever their dream is, give them that opportunity to dream. Uh, let them know that they can be whatever they want. They can get whatever they want in this world. Because in some cases in these villages, the kids don't even go to school. They don't have dreams. They don't know what a dream is. So that's my goal is just to be able to let them know I'm here to help you discover who you are and what you want to do and how you can give back to this world, this planet, because you matter as, as a child of the universe. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I, I can only imagine how special that will feel for all of the students. Well, yeah, I can't wait. I'm, I'm twiddling my thumbs. You know, I'm in the middle of a, a fundraising <laughs> campaign right now, twiddling my thumbs. But everyone can visit. Uh, we have two websites. We have marshalldancecompany.org, O-R-G, Marshall Dance Company. Just spell it out. And then you can also go to Abukutsa Arts Academy. And it's A, B as in, a as in Apple, B as in boy, U, K as in Kenya, U, T is in Tom, S is in Sam, A, that's Abukutsa, and then R, T is in Tom, S is in Sam, and then Academy, A C A D E M Y dot net. So it's Abukutsa Arts Academy dot net. That's our online school. Uh, but if you want to support us, you can go to Marshall Dance Company and uh, go to the donate button. You can read about what you can read about the school and everything on that website. And if you do, if you do donate, you do get uh, in the U.S. at least you're going to get a tax uh, ref, uh, deductible. Your, your donation will be tax deductible. We'll send you a receipt that you can file your taxes with. So um, we'd love we would love as much help as we can get because it takes a village to make anything amazing happen. And I cannot do it by myself. You know, I want to build a, build a team, uh, people that believe in Africa and believe in, in the kids who have had no opportunity, give them an opportunity. Uh, that's the, those are the kinds of people I'm looking for to work with. So if you're interested in working with me, please contact me. <laughs> Excellent. I hope that we can build some connections and broaden that community. Shiva. I'm working as a Tamil language teacher in a government aided school here in Madurai. I'm also work with uh, government school teachers and adolescent students. Excellent. 
How did you begin doing this work? How did you come to start doing it? Me too. Any, any of the work that you're doing, <clears throat> all, what was the inspiration for you to begin doing this work? So from my childhood, I read a lot of books. So uh, whatever I do, I analyze my mm, doings. Is it uh, okay? Is it correct or not? What is the need? So I ask many questions and uh, evaluate myself. So that I want to do something because I part of a society. I want to do something for the society. So that I initiate so many works for the teachers and uh, children. When I was 17, I I roaming around Madurai. I am very much um, binding with Madurai as a adult from my adulthood. I spend all my time in the streets of Madurai. So I know very well about Madurai. And where are you from before that, before you were 17? I study uh, in many hostels. Mm. So my father working in a, a education department, in an office, uh, DEO, district education office. So that he put me in some residential schools. He want to make me as a doctor. Mm. But I'll become an artist. <laughs> I am sitting in a room right now with you where there are many pieces of your art. Can you describe a little bit about your artwork for me and what does it mean to you? So here a uh, lot of my paintings, especially I have two series, a uh, very big series of paintings in my art uh, era uh, practices. So one is a story, a story about Meenakshi. So Madurai is very famous for Meenakshi temple. Meenakshi is the goddess. Uh, this is the only temple we give uh, more importance than the male god to the female god. Mm. So here in Madurai, the people first go and pray Meenakshi, then go to pray Shiva. All of the temples, people go to pray Shiva, then the female god. Here something changed. Mm. So uh, it will make me very interesting. I uh, search uh, about uh, st stories about Meenakshi. Who is Meenakshi and everything. So from that I will develop my own story. Uh, because uh, Madurai is a very oldest city. More than 2000 years old city uh, from the Sangam period. So in our history, uh, especially in Tamil, Tamilians history, the Tamil people are from Kanyakumari. Uh, uh, before that there is an island near Kanyakumari. So on the island sink into the sea, they are migrated to Madurai. Uh, they are very old kings, Pandyas, Meenakshi is their goddess. Mm. So uh, especially another one thing, Meenakshi uh, is a full black uh, skin. She has black skin. So black is the color of native people. Mm. So the uh, Shiva is pure white. So uh, I search in the history. There is a mixer uh, mixing between uh, that uh, Dravidans and Aryans. Some m many stories are there. So that me I believe that Meenachi is a tribal god goddess. So that uh, she has black skin. But in Madurai they uh, draw Meenakshi as a, uh, in green color. Mm. It's a little wonder why a female god <coughs> looks in a green color, green um, skin and everything. Mm. One day I find out the reason because as an artist, um, here in uh, uh, women, women always uh, wear turmeric. Whenever uh, every day they they took bath with. Uh, turmeric applying in their face. Though uh, because of that yellow mixed with uh, black, it mm. will become sap green. Wow. So that the artist uh, draw Minaxi as green. Then I, uh, I, I develop my own story. The goddess, the, the female make the world. She she's the mother of the world. So, but the males 
become slowly dominating the female but the female carry some tribal feels inside them so that i draw fish fish bones and the travel of uh, fish and fish bones is a very big series i have two one man shows about that minachi series uh, this uh, three paintings it's about um, in this is sangam literature <coughs> 2000 years old literature uh, we have uh, the interesting thing is uh, in sangam period uh, there are some female poets are there they wrote very very excellent poems very beautiful poems especially uh, the poems are all about their feelings so that from only one book i will choose only one book is about uh, inner feelings of the people from that book i will uh, select some women poets uh, poems and i read them i feel them then i transfer that feeling into the canvas so these three uh, like that and also i write that poem under the painting so this are all so yes i can see in your paintings you can see an abstract visual representation yes. of the feeling that you receive from the poem and then you include the work um as well i love it and your work as an educator did you place much importance on the feelings and the emotions of your students and how did you encourage them to share those feelings and emotions and were there any challenges to you in the common educational system to being able to encourage those emotions to come out so mostly uh in in our education system we rely on um, words we have text we, we memorize the text and vomiting on the paper so we pouring knowledge into the minds of the children but we don't have space for express their own feelings so i think uh, this is the most important uh, we don't give them words um don't tell lie uh, peace and everything we we always give words we don't give space uh, for practicing that uh, values so that i'll uh, try to make them uh, express their own feelings uh, to write write their own feelings to speak their own feelings so that uh, my uh, all my activities based on sharing their own feelings with uh, uh, teacher he believe beautiful how do you feel that impacts your students and what do you learn from that yourself so every day every day i learn from them i th- regular practice will make a teacher uh, will, uh, the practice will give a teacher some little pride the the pride the collective pride make is a very proud man i am a teacher and like that uh, it will give crowns uh, <laughs> invisible crowns uh, to the teacher so every day some children they they break my crowns so i learn a lot from them uh, whenever i speak to them uh, every day they give a new lesson so i i catch it then i i feel it i have to change myself according to that uh, their own uh, surrounding and own life everything how does your work connect with the greater movement of non-violence or peace and what what do you feel is your relationship to non-violence and peace work so i believe in love love is the only uh, every any religion all the religions talk about love only but their own words so that um, in the world is full of love we are the travelers we come and live a little period in the world so we live peacefully we live with others even uh, not only human all the 
living and non living things they have own rights to live in, in the world so so the peace is very important the friendship the love is very important so they they have to, but the society are like that society make many uh, pressure many pressure on the next generation so i i will always told them read reading is a very important thing read reading literature and search for knowledge knowledge means uh, search for everything then analyze it in yourself don't believe into some person even any person you don't uh, blindly believe and rely on any person you ask questions even gandhi you ask questions any man buddha you ask questions real buddha like questions real gandhi like questions questions make a man perfect perfect means living peacefully not to hurt others even by word or action people just believe in in other life in person they 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 have to believe something is going on there is uh, there is a practice so that uh, this is the very big problem uh, in a classroom if the exam uh, why they like exams they give some questions or something some lessons so after the exam they got good marks this is the good practice the people think like that uh, but practice values is not a only a job it is a lifelong practice so it will make slowly it will make change we did not see the sudden changes because uh, it's not possible also in in this world so the change will come very slowly people believe believe is a very, very uh, important i think believing is a very important thing believing on self believe on human so believe everybody no good no bad believe people love people slow all love the world everything thank you so much for doing this interview with me i really appreciate it and i wish you the best in your work My name is Kristen Mahood and I come from Edmonton, Alberta and I am a teacher. Wonderful. And how did you come to be doing this work? What was your first inspiration and what, you know, what um what led me here? Yeah, how did you get <laughs> um, here? So I have always in my earliest memory wanted to be a teacher. So that was I I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um and then you know throughout my career i've always had the privilege of working with um marginalized students or students with um developmental disabilities or physical disabilities um so in a lot of ways i think it chose me and then i evolved to uh to do the work that is wonderful and what is your connection to the community that you work in Uh so I actually live not far from the school that I work at. Um I don't actually live in the community that I work at, but one or two communities over. So roughly the same uh demographics as where I I live is also where I work. And did you grow up in that area also? I did. Um I did grow up in that area. Uh I had uh many jobs that were further away from where I lived and then I uh, just wanted the commute to be easier and the balance of life to be easier so then I was fortunate enough to get over the years a job closer to home um which would allow me to have more time and a better balance that is wonderful and what is it that you love the most about what you do um I love that every day is different and that I get to work with some of the most amazing people Um kids have this this wonderful way of uh being exactly who they are without all of the pretense and um 
I think that is the most purest uh, form of life and living and they will tell you immediately uh, how they're feeling or what they're thinking um, and I feel like it's uh, a privilege to really get to know my students and uh, you know a lot of times you'll hear me say my kids but yes I feel like we are a community together and um, I think every day learning something new is, is pretty amazing. I think so too and as long as I've been involved in nonviolence work it has been a journey something that is always ever evolving and ever changing. Absolutely. And yeah. that dynamic aspect of it is kind of what keeps me coming back every day with new excitement. How can you tell me a little bit about how your work with the kids connects with nonviolence work and um, peace work as a whole? How do you incorporate that into your work with your students? Um, so originally when I started to do work, I, uh, I started in, a, in special education. Um, it wasn't something I had, had anticipated happening. I, I went through um, regular education to, to be a teacher, to be an elementary teacher. And a job opened up in special education and I uh, applied and was lucky enough to get in. Um, and then I feel like the real work for, sort of happened where I, I had a, a group of students that needed a lot of extra support that my training hadn't prepared me for. Um, and I wanted to be better teacher in order to teach them better, in order to support them better. So then I went back and I did my master's um, in education and language and literacy and sort of happened upon um, a course in, uh, through the Gandhi Summer Institute um, and took it. I, I didn't have sort of an idea of what um, really Gandhian pedagogy was or Gandhian philosophy um, or really any experience besides just maybe hearing the word Gandhi in my life. Um, but it was a summer course that was available, so I took it, um, and it was definitely life-changing. It gave me the ideas and philosophies uh, taught sort of gave me a blueprint or a framework that I could then feel like I could take back into my own classroom and into my own work um, using sort of these guiding ideas um, as a way to help better serve the communities that I was working with. And can you give me some specific examples of some of those ideas yeah, that really absolutely. inspired you? <laughs> So the idea of ahimsa um, was one that immediately I was drawn to. So the idea to do no harm and what did that look like? Um, and I thought uh, I needed a way to build a community within my classroom and a way that kids could connect with on a tangible level. So I was trying to think of um, basic needs. So there were students in my classroom that um, needed food that for whatever reason weren't coming to school with enough food. Um, and some of those reasons could, could have been poverty, but some of them could have also been, uh, you know, not enough time in the morning or not enough knowledge to make a healthy meal or access to ingredients um, for a variety of reasons. So it wasn't strictly necessarily a poverty thing, although it, it could have been in, in many cases. but. Um, I just I needed a way for for me to have a uh, a tangible way that kids could sort of bring um, sorry a tangible way that kids could basically a way to connect to the ideas I was learning in class and so I, I thought of food as a way to um, sort of bridge that knowledge and, uh, and lay that groundwork so I began to or I guess I continued. Uh, I used to cook with the kids anyways as a way to kind of bring together um, people from all different backgrounds and all different cultures to s slow down and have a meal together and have some enjoyment and um, then when I took the course I sort of realized it could also be used as a platform uh, to understand and expose children to Gandhian principles. So when you look at ahimsa to do no harm um, in aspect of food, then it, you know when you cook, um, 
what does it mean to do no harm with food? So where does your food come from? Where is it produced? What are some of the local issues around uh, access to food, around usage of food, around production of food? Um, when you look at the cleanup for cooking, uh, is the work equally shared? Is everybody partaking in cleaning up and and uh, or bringing and preparing and, and cooking and cleaning up uh, the food that you're making? Um, when you look at incorporating people from different backgrounds, is the food that you're offering something that you can adjust so everybody can partake? So if there are dietary or religious restrictions, um, what are steps that you can take that you can show that you, you value and respect their similarities and differences and be inclusive um, in those choices? So for example, just uh, I had a bunch of students that had were halal, um, had halal dietary restrictions, um, and so I was able to simply adjust a recipe to include halal marshmallows so that they could then make uh, you know rice cereal treats um, and be included completely and seamlessly within the classroom. Um, the halal students were really felt like they had been seen and honored and that they're um, able to still partake in um, in making the Halloween activity um, or I guess it wasn't necessarily a Halloween activity but a fall activity right we did we did uh, rice cereal pumpkins um, but just so that they could still be included and that and then they also had a platform to talk about their culture in a positive light where kids could experience it um, and have a better understanding of, of who they were and, and why they had the choices that they made around whatever ideas they were expressing. So using your, your platform of these Food know, experience, recipes. yeah, so, cooking and food and coming together yeah. in community. Creating a conversation Exactly, each other. yeah, and a dialogue and, and being able to look at um, essentially using food and food experiences and cooking as a way to um, discuss and share those big ideas and theologies, right, of, of what does it mean to do no harm, what does it mean to have bread labor and work and and what does it mean to be a trustee of the land and where things are coming from? What does it mean to respect ideas and differences and similarities um, in a way that is non-threatening and non-judgmental? Um, and sort of build and instill those, those ideas in a, in a way that kids can relate to um, and that would affect them in everyday life. So you mentioned earlier that when you first got into this work, you felt a little bit underprepared for what you were being asked to do. And what advice could you give to someone in that position? I feel like a lot of the time in nonviolence work, we come into a situation and we go, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with this. <laughs> so what, what could you say to someone struggling with that, that feeling of not being prepared? Yes, prepared. And um, I would say that that feeling is something that I, I feel off and on continually and that continues to drive uh, my, my drive me to find um, more ideas, connect with people, to share and express ideas um, and, and learn as much as I possibly can from others um, so that I can then apply it to my own situation. Um, so I, I would feel like, yes, the work at times can feel and the ideas and concepts can feel incredibly overwhelming, um, but that, you know, just, just pick something that you're passionate in and really start to look at it from different viewpoints and lenses um, and pick something that, you know, you see that you might be able to do and try it um, and see where it leads in the moment and the situation and it's amazing. Um, from there where it can go. Well, that is absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for meeting with me today, Christy. And I look forward to hearing more about your projects in the future. Thank you for having me.
I think one of the questions that I asked all of the educators um, was what inspired them to follow that path. Um, and I guess I kind of want to ask you on a broader scale, what do you think inspires educators as a whole to continue down the path that, you know, we, what do you think inspires as edu educators to keep working towards these sort of lofty goals of providing information to people, but also specifically towards peace? Wow. Uh, nothing like starting with a softball, eh? Um, I think in, in, uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to start with the second part first, and then I'll get back to the first question. I think the biggest issue in terms of um, of educators that I know uh, is the biggest reason that they go into education is because they um, value relationships. They value the relationships that they have with students. They value the relationships they have with their colleagues, and at the heart of it, a lot of the work that we do in Education for Peace is about those relationships. And it's not simply about, you know, sort of getting to know people and, and being able to go out and have coffee with them later. It's really about uh, engaging with, uh, and particularly young people, and um, helping them to uncover who they are. And in that process, one of the things that a lot of, of educators come to is that the, um, the whole education system, like many other systems in our, our society, has been um, shaped by a lot of historic features that make it inhospitable to uh, a lot of students. And it's from there then when they're so invested in their own students that they start to look for ways to, to change the everyday interactions, but also to change the system. And um, a lot of the uh, educators that I've worked with, and here's coming to my, my uh, own engagement as well, um, we've started with things like um, uh, education for social justice or anti-oppression education. And the issues that come up quite often, they certainly did for me, and I hear this from the, the, the teachers that I work with, is that those approaches to education tend to bifurcate. They tend to divide the world into those who are... Uh, aggressors or uh, uh, dominant uh, players and those who are victims. And uh, it's, it's a very difficult position. It's a great way to do analysis. It's a very difficult position from which to do education if what you are concerned about is building relationship. And Education for Peace, with a focus on nonviolence, with a focus on ahimsa, gives that path to be able to work for peace through relationship building. There's my long-winded answer. Wow, that was really good. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that I started with a softball. <clears throat> yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, well, thank you. I like to think about um, kind of what you're talking about, uh, the breakdown of some of those dichotomies that are created by the types of conversations, the important conversations that we're having, um, because anymore, especially after speaking with the people that I got to talk to for this episode, it, it, puts everything into more of a global lens um, and takes me out of, you know, specifically my connection to where I am. Um, the United States just has its own struggles and, and uh, tends to fall into these, those kinds of um, bifurcated conversations. 
And so broadening out to a more global lens is so helpful for me to take me out of that. Um, what do you think educators from different countries or even just different communities with different needs, how do you think they can support each other? Um, what, what kind of concrete ways can they reach out to each other? And are there like, are there frameworks and infrastructure for that already? And um, if there's not, how can they go about creating those connections? Yeah, those uh, great questions again. Uh, there are there are larger infrastructures. There are international organizations. There are um, things like Facebook groups and that sort of thing. Um, I think though, um, and and those serve a huge purpose. I think what has, uh, in my experience, what has been much more valuable uh, for people. Uh, is to connect uh, individually, networking, in other words. So those are ways in which that networking can be facilitated, but simply sort of joining uh, the International Peace Research Association or uh, the Facebook group on, on justice and peace for educators, those things are not going to um, give you very much. I mean, people will post things that they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. But it's it's that networking. It's, it's actually being able to talk with other educators and find those places to do that. Um, we started a, a small series of webinars um, back in September on that we call educating for justice through peace and that was really a big focus of what we were doing there was trying to bring educators from all over all over the world really together in conversation now it hasn't been wildly successful in terms of numbers but i feel really good about it because we have had educators from at least oh i would say about 15 to 20 countries uh, from multiple perspectives on education. We have looked at issues of, of spirituality. We have linked with um, educational approaches like uh, critical pedagogy. We have connected with the arts. Um, those things are supremely important um, in terms of thinking about education for peace because part of it is that education for peace is not just one thing. You know, when we're talking about education for peace, we're talking about uh, a kind of underlying uh, belief system and people pick it up in different kinds of ways. Uh, we've uh, been working in Edmonton. I've been working with a group of teachers on something that we've called slow peace. And uh, the big part that we have uh, found in slow peace, and this is obviously Gandhian inspired uh, as an approach, is that we have to internalize all these values that we think we need to bring into our classrooms. And um, to do that, we need to be in constant conversation. And that's the, the uh, essence, I suppose, of the, the work that we've been trying to do in um uh in in slow peace so i think yeah there's uh to, to get this work out there to get the work done um people not only have to have their own vision but they have to be able to engage with other people who have a slightly different vision um from them to be able to to grow awesome um, so on that topic, on the topic of educators deepening their understanding of those values and uh, internalizing them, I mean, without internalizing them, there's no way for the, anyone to properly communicate in their own sort of understanding and style. Um, so what resources are out there? Um, for educators just to learn more about peace and um, ahimsa and how can they, what is a touch point for them to enter into this sort of world? Um, 
Yeah. So again, lots of things out there, lots of good resources, good work that's been done over the years. Um, our uh, friend Mayas Toroeng uh, started an organization called Seeds for Peace uh, at, at, that has uh, amazing resources. Um, the the work that uh, the the group I was talking about in Edmonton uh, has been doing. Part of it's been cataloged in a um, on a website called Lo Slow Peace and the Long March. Um, there's lots of of things that people are doing the um the big issue is is that resources are never a problem the biggest part of it is for people to make the commitment and start to engage and that's always the starting point. That's got to be the starting point. We had for several years um, the Mahatma Gandhi Summer Institute for Building Peaceful Communities in Edmonton at the University of Alberta. It was a joint project of the Mahatma Gandhi Canadian Foundation and the, the U of A. Um, it was an amazing place where we uh, worked with educators to uh, not to give them a way of doing this, but to introduce them to ideas and to get them to think about their own practice and to see how this, these ideas could blend with their practice. And the educators that continued with that work, the ones that, that have really gone deep are the ones who could see those connections and could, could build those connections for themselves. Um, uh, and then once you, you know sort of which path you're on, uh, you can do this. There's multiple resources that are out there then when you find what, what it is you want to do with it. It sounds like a lifelong sort of practice that you would be in to even, you know, to develop how you would engage with those ideas. Um, and speaking on that too, like, one of the things that uh, was really brought to my attention was that in the different interviews, when I asked what challenges were faced by the, um, whether it was the teacher or their students, right? A lot of the time, the, the challenges that are faced by the teachers, um, and I think this was true for Anindo, um, she said that, you know, the students face a lot of challenges and it sounded to me as though those challenges were internalized by her. Mm -hmm. um, so the population that she seeks to serve, but also, I mean, in all, in all those interviews, the people that the, the students are facing their issues with schooling, testing, um, accessibility, and then the teachers themselves internalize those issues. And I can't imagine that that doesn't come with some sort of burnout. Um, and, and so what can be beyond um, the sort of networking that we've talked about, is there anything that teachers can do to keep their strength up mm. when the challenges seem sort of insurmountable at times? Yeah, it's interesting that you, you asked that question because last night I was uh, on a, a Zoom call with uh, some of the teachers that I've been working with here in Edmonton and we've been continuing to, to meet, not to talk about slow peace, but just to talk about what's going on for them. And part of that has been that, that on top of all of those things that you mentioned, which have been the regular sorts of things that people have, teachers have had on their plate, this year with COVID, there's been so much more. There, uh, all three of the teachers that I was talking with last night, for example, have been teaching online. And um, without going into specifics about the kinds of things that, that they have encountered, um, part of what they were talking about was just the uh, horrendous uh, inequities that they were seeing um, because of that, the, uh, the, the ways in which they uh, 
see that that this one year and its in, uh, and what it will do to students will create even larger inequities in the system. Um, all of that is is weighing on them. It's weighing on them heavily. And so uh, we talked for quite a while. And at the end of it, um, what I suggested was we just uh, record the next conversation we have and use that as the basis to write some letters to the Alberta Teachers Association, to write to the uh, official opposition uh, here in Alberta. Um, and uh, because two of the teachers uh, are also uh, visual artists, I said, then let's create some artwork and some poetry and, um, and share this. And I think that's the thing is that it's, it can't be allowed to just fester and it can't be allowed uh, to, you can't allow it to just feel like it's your own burden and nobody else can know it. Nobody else can share it. You've got to find good ways to share it and uh, ways that will make a difference because in the end, they're concerned about the students. They're not concerned about themselves. And um, and so they got really excited about this. And uh, they did make a joke about me giving them homework, but <laughs> it, you know, I'm a teacher, <laughs> that's what I do. Um, but it is, I think that's the thing. I think it's, it's the networking is part of it, but uh, a bigger part of it is, um, is, is finding ways to engage, to change what's going on. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you for listening. We hope these stories show how education plays an active part in making the world a more peaceful and nonviolent place for all of us. Speaking Our Peace is produced by Annie Luck, Ashima Vishnoi, Priya Joshi, and Reva Joshi. We can be reached by email at speakingourpeace at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Our Peace Podcast. Or check out our website, speakingourpeace.com. Our music is made by Sunbear. We are supported by the International Gandhian Institute for Nonviolence and Peace Canada, the Mohammed Gandhi Canadian Foundation for World Peace, and Jai Jagat. See you next time.